Incoming transmission. Welcome. 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 Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? I'm Vanessa Kirby, and this is True Spies Team Alpha. Part two, first casualty. In the last episode of True Spies, journalist Toby Harnden and former CIA officer David Tyson explained how on the 24th of November, 2001, something was brewing at the fortress Kalajangi. There were two explosions. Two suicide bombers blew themselves up. And at the time, it was not clear what they were doing because we had not had, up to that point, any suicide bombers take any of that action. So it was not clear what was going on, uh, but it was clear that we had no business there on the evening of 24 November. David and his colleague had driven out to the fort to meet their Afghan allies and interrogate Al-Qaeda prisoners. But the explosions sent them back. Now, the next morning, they're heading back in. If you haven't heard the last episode, go take a listen now. We'd hate to spoil the ending. But just to recap, David Tyson was one of eight members of Team Alpha, a group of CIA officers sent to Afghanistan in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. With their help, the city of Mazari Sharif had been liberated from the Taliban. But even though the city had fallen, it became clear to David and to his colleagues that a crisis had not been averted. Villages that were majority Pashtun, primary ethnic group of the Taliban, that had once been safe to enter, were now no longer danger-free. Prisoners were being held captive and bartered. While President Bush and the Pentagon were celebrating a victory, the view from Afghanistan looked much less rosy. But even when you're a CIA officer working in the far reaches of the globe, the globe keeps spinning. Life back home carries on. And every so often, David's colleague, Mike Spann, would get a reminder when he dialed home to Virginia to speak with his wife, Shannon. Toby Harnden is the journalist who became fascinated with Team Alpha after seeing a video of David Tyson running for his life. Throughout Team Alpha's time in Afghanistan, Shannon and, and Mike would speak whenever they could via satellite phone. Shannon was a, another CIA officer, so she was also following events from CIA headquarters. She would go in sometimes, or she had colleagues who were able to tell her more than most spouses would be able to be told about what was going on. So she knew what Mike was doing. After the fall of Mazari Sharif, as Team Alpha were preparing for their next task, Shannon Spann was getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving. Shannon was in Yosemite in a cabin where she'd gone with her parents and sisters every Thanksgiving since uh, she'd been a child. And Mike said that Team Alpha was due to be relieved in early December, so he'd be back for Christmas. They talked about uh, getting bikes for Mike's daughters, and they talked about having a, a period of calm and stability at home that you know they'd been unable to have, certainly since 9-11 and even before that. But it was a difficult phone call for Shannon, and she couldn't quite put her finger on exactly what it was, but for some sort of sense of foreboding. And when um, the call ended and she put the phone down, she burst into tears and she couldn't understand quite why. Back in the United States, intelligence reports warned of another attack on US soil. Five Americans were killed and 17 more were infected by letters delivered by the US Postal Service that had been laced with a dangerous chemical commonly known as anthrax. Some feared that another 9-11 was around the corner. And on the ground in Afghanistan, Team Alpha was keen to stop an attack before it could happen. 
After the fall of Masri Sharif, the next big battle, in fact, the Taliban's expected last stand in northern Afghanistan was in Kunduz, which was about 100 miles to the east of Masri Sharif. Before what's expected to be a big battle in Kunduz, Dostum met with Mullah Fazl and Mullah Nouri, who were two top Taliban commanders in northern Afghanistan. Afghan warlord Abdul Rashid Dostum and Mullah Fazl led the negotiations. Dostum had been an unlikely but indispensable ally to the United States. Fazl was not the sort of guy you want to tango with. Mullah Fazl had a reputation of being a sort of fearless slayer of Hazaras who'd been taken part in ethnic cleansing, the burning of Hazara villages. He was feared and loathed by every non-Pashtun in northern Afghanistan. But the Afghan sort of way of war is to negotiate surrenders even with your sworn enemy, and that would often also involve sometimes switching sides. Remember, even Dostum himself had a tendency to switch sides when it was advantageous. Fazl might have been despised, but he also presented an opportunity. If the Northern Alliance leaders could negotiate a surrender, they could potentially avoid the bloody battle that lay ahead in Kunduz. Dostum and Fazl negotiated for hours, and at the end of their negotiations, they announced that there'd been a deal. But it was always extremely murky exactly what this deal would entail. The Americans were adamant that no Al-Qaeda forces or foreign fighters would be allowed to escape the area. But the sort of American government's belief was that this should be an Afghan deal for all its sort of murkiness and ambiguity. But American forces were not there to fight this war for the Afghans, they were there to sort of advise, but it, it needed an Afghan solution. And so um, the deal between Dostum and Fazl was that uh, Taliban forces would surrender, and uh, that's what Dostum believed had been agreed, and that they would uh, give up their fight, and that would be the end of it. The Americans were now stationed in Kalajangi, the fortress in the west of Mazari Sharif, along with their indigenous allies. It was a symbolic piece of real estate, and one that had seen quite a few tenants over the course of its history. Kalajangi, which translates roughly as House of War, was this medieval-looking fort. It looks like something uh, out of the Arabian Nights, just sort of dominating the landscape. And it's, you know, incredibly imposing place uh, that every commander in Masri Sharif would always make his headquarters. And so once Masri Sharif fell, the Taliban abandoned Kalajangi, and it was an, the natural initial base for the Americans to set up. And in the southern compound was an old Soviet-built schoolhouse known as the Pink House. In the Pink House, it was a, a cellar which had been fortified to uh, store weapons. It was like a, a bunker. At the time, the Pink House held something else too. Hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. On 24 November, we had received word that a large number of Al-Qaeda prisoners had surrendered and would be coming to the city. So when we got word about the prisoners coming back, sort of the skeleton crew at Mazar, we just understood that we would have to deal with these prisoners along with our Afghan allies. And given the fact that they were Al-Qaeda members, it was clear to us that uh, we needed to go out and sort of figure out who these guys were, gather the basic intelligence as to their identity and their documents and so forth, and start the process of doing what we sort of do best is collect intelligence. A significant opportunity for Team Alpha, if perhaps a sizable task. Mike and I were basically the only two agency officers in Mazar at the time. There was a couple others, but they were moving about doing other things. So people have always asked, how did you deal with this and what did you think and so forth? Well, I just saw it and Mike just saw it as another day. So on 25 November, we went out in the early morning. And by that time, it was a little more clear that this was a big deal in the sense that we indeed had four to 500 Al-Qaeda prisoners. And this was the first time since 9-11 that such a number of Al-Qaeda forces were in our hands, so to speak, and that we would have access to them. 
And I don't mean us, just our team, but I'm talking the U.S. government writ large. And I'll never forget, Mike was extremely eager to go, extremely eager to get out there. These men were different from the other prisoners David had interrogated before. For one thing, he gathered, they'd all given an oath of allegiance to Al-Qaeda and its founder, Osama bin Laden. They were also all foreigners. What we understood very quickly is we did not have the wherewithal to gather the information that we needed to gather. The rest of the eight-man team were needed to work elsewhere that day. They had discussed whether American military backup might be needed at the fort that day. But ultimately, it was up to Dostum's men to provide security for the CIA men. Because of his skills as a linguist, David shouldered much of the burden of speaking with prisoners. Mike did not speak a foreign language. We had great Afghan helpers, Afghans who were more or less trained intelligence personnel as well. But what we didn't have were the facilities and the manpower and the ability to record the information. We're just sort of writing things down in notebooks. And so it quickly became clear to all of us that we would need to be spending days and have other kinds of help. Other kinds of help, meaning a doctor, for example. Many of those prisoners had wounds that were badly in need of treatment. Wounds that would lead to infection, or worse, without timely attention. So, by mid-morning on the 25th of November, it was clear that David and Mike were out of their depth. They'd need additional support to handle all of the prisoners in their midst. Shortly after 11am, uh, most of the prisoners were out, there were perhaps 18 or so still in the cellar. And Syed Kamal had said to David that uh, he thought that there were ethnic Uzbeks who were still in the, in the cellar, and some of them were hardcore senior guys. David trusted Syed Kamal to know. He was Dostum's intelligence chief. Kamal warned that some of the prisoners had dangerous weapons and that some of them likely felt betrayed that Fazil had handed them over. Just as David and Mike were preparing to finish for the morning, the last prisoners were being brought out. I was at the time taking prisoners and sort of isolating them so that I could speak to them in private. And that was a distance away from where Mike was. And during that process, when we understood that there were about 30 to 40 prisoners left for us to sort of talk to and take pictures of, shouts, screams, and explosions and gunfire began in the building, which was very, very close to where Mike was located at the time. David Tyson is in the middle of questioning the hundreds of prisoners at the fortress Kalajangi, when suddenly there's a flurry of activity in the distance. Gunshots, explosions, screams. It's an uprising. What had happened was that um, a number of those last prisoners had ascended the metal stairs from the cellar into the pink house and overcome the guards. Now, some of the prisoners hadn't been searched properly. Some of them had grenades and, and weapons on them, and they were able to overcome the guards, seize weapons from the guards, kill them, and rush out into the southern compound. Which is where they encountered Mike. Mike swung around towards where this commotion was happening. His Kalashnikov was on his back, and he pulled it round into the firing position and shot dead prisoners that were rushing towards him who were clearly intent on staging an uprising. As he did, though, some of the prisoners were rushing him from behind. All of a sudden, he had people jumping on his back and trying to pull him to the ground, pulled out his Glock pistol and shot some of them, but he sort of disappeared basically between a pile of bodies of these prisoners who were trying to wrestle his weapons from him. Meanwhile, David is far from the action, trying to piece together what's taken place. I quickly uh, obviously understood something was going on, but I did not know at the time what to do. And I remember grabbing or taking my pistol out of my uh, holster 
and just standing there observing and, and staring at the area where all this was coming from, which is about 150 meters from my location. And that's when everything started. So I had these couple seconds of, of not really knowing, you know, what was going on, obviously, and not knowing as well what to do. But that feeling of uh, confusion quickly dissipated when I heard Mike's voice yelling my name. And he did so twice to three times, and I heard that. And as soon as I heard that, I moved, started to run towards Mike. As David ran, he realized he'd begun to perceive his surroundings differently. I want to stress that these were not normal sort of decisions that one makes, uh, you know, every day. I was very quickly sort of transported to a different plane where things that I did were automatic. I was not thinking normally, but that was something that I almost immediately felt that things had changed fundamentally for me mentally. I was in a place where I'd never been before or since. I immediately understood that something was very, very strange. For David, time has warped. Moments pass like hours. But it's only been a matter of seconds since Mike disappeared under the pile of bodies. David is still making his way in the direction of his voice. During this process, as I'm running, or I don't know if I'm running, but I'm, I'm moving very quickly with a sense of purpose. I might be sort of jogging. I have my pistol drawn, and a young man runs towards me. And he, he's at a distance at first, but quickly becoming closer and I look at the kid's face and I say kid because you know he was in his 20s probably uh, you know a young man and I realize and I think to myself I've seen this kid before and why is he over here why is he running towards me and then on top of that he has something in his hand and he's holding what he has in his hand out and as I focus on the hand I see he has a pistol, and on top of that, I see that he's he's shooting the pistol at me. When I realized he was shooting at me, it was it was like irking me. It was an irksome irritation. Like, uh, why why do you want to do this? The whole experience is for David a rather curious set of events. It's not so much terrifying or enraging or invigorating as it is puzzling, fascinating even. Things were happening sort of in a slow motion way, but I was thinking very, very quickly. And I was thinking not only thoughts like this, like here's this kid, what's he doing? But also sort of superfluous thoughts like, man, this is odd, this is strange, what's going on here? I feel like I'm floating, I can't hear anything. What's going on, this is crazy. I talk to myself make comments to myself of how strange this is. But in that process with the kid, I remember telling myself, shoot that guy. And that's what I did. I shot him twice. He crumbled to the ground. And I jumped over him, sort of, and continued on to Mike. The feeling that time has slowed down is one that's common to people in crisis situations. Faced with such an extreme threat, the body and mind go into overdrive, doing everything they can to keep a person alive, and in David's case, to keep Mike alive as well. When I did reach where Mike was, there were four men on top of him, and I remember very clearly shooting each one of them twice, one at a time and then backwards again a second time. And one of the men had Mike's rifle in his hands and was trying to get that rifle or secure that rifle, if you will. I don't know if Mike had it in his hands or it was somewhere else, but this man was pulling at the rifle. And so when I shot the men, I grabbed Mike's rifle, and in this process, and I don't know which came first or second, I saw Mike's body there, and I began to kick him very hard in the leg, yelling his name. At the same time, fully understanding that I could not hear myself, 
yell his name and wondering again why this was happening. Why couldn't I hear my voice yell Mike's name? And as I kicked him very, very hard in the leg several times, yelling his name, then I saw that he had been shot in the head. And I didn't bend down. I didn't, you know, do anything else. I moved onwards. Remember the video that Toby saw years later of David running for his life, clutching a pistol in one hand and a Kalashnikov in the other. That was the moment David was living now, as he bolted towards the northern compound, hoping to survive long enough to make it to the headquarters building. He's seen his comrade killed. He's nearly been killed himself. A miraculous escape. He's killed many, many, probably dozens of Al-Qaeda fighters. And he's still not safe. David is surrounded by men, Al-Qaeda recruits, who want to kill him. Remember, they're prisoners. Many of them still have their hands tied behind their backs. But that doesn't stop them throwing themselves at David, trying to knock him down. Caused me so much, you know, consternation, if you will. And I'll use that word because I think that's the best way to describe it. I was just agitated by these guys and upset that they were trying to kill me as if, you know, they shouldn't be doing this because I had nothing against them. I didn't want to shoot them, but they were coming at me, so I was feeling like I had to. David picked up an AK-47 loaded with its final rounds of ammunition. When he felt a thud against his back, he turned round to see a prisoner, his hands tied, ramming his head against him. David fired at the man. It's not like, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Or is this good or is this bad? You know, are you afraid or not? There's no fear. There's no courage. There's no bravery. There's nothing but just doing this thing on a different plane. And then a couple of the guys later on, and I'm talking a few seconds later, I had this one encounter with a man who had a rifle and he was shooting his rifle at me and we were very, very close to each other and he was behind a tree trunk and a wall, sort of jumping out, shooting at me and then hiding again. I was shooting at him. I remember understanding at the time this was ridiculous, utterly ridiculous to be doing this because I was going to get killed or he was going to get killed and it served no purpose. It reminded me of playing cops and robbers as a kid, something that was just so odd and bizarre. At one point, he pulled a wounded Northern Alliance member over to the side of a vehicle, out of harm's way. He has no memory of this. He was told about it later, but he probably saved that man's life. Finally, after I think it's pretty clear now, about 18 minutes, 17 to 18 minutes, I made my way to another part of this fortress where I came into, you know, sort of a safe zone, relative safety. So I had escaped. That's when things started moving at normal speed again. And that's when David began to process everything he'd just been through. When I got up to this area of safety, relative safety, I, I squatted down. And I remember very clearly now just saying, you know, what the, what the hell just happened? And just sort of breathing and shaking a little bit. And I had my rifle and just sort of looking around saying, okay, you're really here. You're not anywhere else. This is real. This just happened. And now let's, let's get on with it. Imagine. You've just lived through the most harrowing experience of your life. You've fatally shot many people in order to defend yourself. You've made your way across a treacherous battlefield. And you've finally arrived to safety. And yet, the battle that nearly killed you rages on. No time to sit back and rest on your laurels. Your mission still isn't complete. I'll let Toby fill you in on what happened next. These Al-Qaeda members were there to fight to the death. And there were containers, shipping containers inside the fort that had contained a lot of weapons, which the prisoners were able to get hold of, and they fought back tenaciously. Um, so November the 26th, on that morning, 
the Americans tried to end the whole thing by dropping a 2,000 pound bomb on the pink house. There was a mistake by a pilot of, of the F-18s overhead and that 2,000 pound bomb actually was dropped onto the northeast tower of the fort, which was a friendly position, wounded five Americans, flipped over a Northern Alliance tank and killed a number of Northern Alliance fighters. After that, it was deemed too dangerous for the Americans to drop weapons on the fort. This war would now be fought by Dostum and the rest of the Northern Alliance. Their US allies would take a back seat. David and Mike had been the only ones questioning prisoners in Mazari Sharif on the 25th of November. Now, Team Alpha's mission, for all seven of its surviving members, was to recover the body of Mike Spann. But that meant David, having endured so much already, had to return to the fortress. He'd been the last one to see Mike. He had the best chance of helping the team locate his body. I was extremely reluctant to go back. I was scared in a way that I had never been afraid before, to the point of shaking, violent shaking. You know, I had not been sleeping at all through this process. And I was coaxed into going back by my teammates because I spoke the language, I knew where Mike's body was and so forth. And each day that I went back, I was, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, scared shitless. David had just endured the most traumatic experience of his life. And for three days after, Team Alpha still had to return to the site. But each day I went back and they told me, let's go up here and let's do this. And I would say, no, no, I'll sit down here. I'll wait down here. And you hear the bullets whiz over your head or, you know, it's not that dangerous from a certain standpoint, but I was still scared. I remember very clearly crouching uh, one day next to a tank. We had also, <laughs> we had, the Afghans had tanks and they brought one of these old Soviet tanks in. I remember crouching next to it and uh, hearing this rattling noise and just looking over to my arm and seeing my, you know, my rifle beating into this tank tread, you know, cause I was shaking so much. It was the morning of November the 28th, early in the morning, the Northern Alliance fighters had done a sweep through the Southern compound and all the um, Al-Qaeda fighters, they were back inside the pink house cellar and the Southern compound more broadly was under control of the Northern Alliance and it was strewn with bodies. The Northern Alliance had used a tank to clear the area. Then they conducted a search near the place where David had last seen Mike. And Commander Fakir, who was one of the commanders that uh, David had fought with in the mountains, came to David and said, was Mike wearing cowboys? Cowboys. That was the term that Afghans used for blue jeans. Sure enough, Mike had been wearing a pair during the uprising on November the 25th. So a group of Afghans picked up the body, which was very close to where David had last seen Mike, just next to the pink house, and brought the body through the gateway into the northern compound. Turned out to be two gunshot wounds to the head, which had been what had killed him. One of the Green Berets, Mario Vigil, who's um, a master sergeant, He'd carried a flag into Kuwait during the Gulf War in 1991 and had brought the flag with him. And so Mike's body was draped in this American flag and Team Alpha members carried him out of the northern compound and into a, a van that uh, was waiting and, and they drove the body back to the Turkish school in Masri Sharif. Mike Spann had become the very first American casualty of the war in Afghanistan. 2,400 more would follow. And many, many non-Americans would die too, as a result of the war on terror. A war that would soon spiral outwards, beyond Afghanistan, to claim an estimated 900,000 lives. That number includes thousands of civilians, thousands of children. And the conflict continues to take its toll. But what happened later was not something Team Alpha foresaw in those first days and months after 9-11. Once their colleague was confirmed dead at Kalajangi, their mission had ended. Mourning Mike is something that didn't happen and is over. It's something that, you know, sort of happens frequently for me. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. You know, Mike is part of who I am now and He's like a shadow 
lurking over me. And he was a serious guy. You know, he's a Marine, he's a patriot. So I, I sometimes wonder, you know, what he's thinking, so to speak. So Mike is never far away. And that's one thing. And he left a hole in the CIA as well, because uh, it, it's clear to me and, and clear to many other people who, who know things better than I, that Mike would have been a very senior leader in the agency had he survived. If there was one place on 25 November uh, 2001 where Mike wanted to be professionally, it was right where he was. Now, obviously, personally, all of us would prefer to be with our families and so forth. But professionally, there was no other place that Mike wanted to be on 25 November 2001 than where he was that day. And in spite of the death of one of their own, Team Alpha's mission had been a success. There was this formula of hundreds of Americans, not the 100,000 that we later had in Afghanistan. But hundreds of Americans working as advisors alongside the indigenous allies of the Northern Alliance against the foreign invaders of Al-Qaeda. And that was a formula that worked. After a review of the Battle of Kalajengi, the CIA awarded David its highest honor, the Distinguished Intelligence Cross for extraordinary heroism. David went on to serve the agency for another two decades. He retired in 2020. But of course, that wasn't the end of this story. You remember how it happened. Crowds clamoring onto the airport tarmac, clinging to cargo planes as they lifted off the runway. Thousands of interpreters left stranded, facing an uncertain future under a vengeful regime. It was history made painfully before our eyes, and it happened not even a year ago. When the United States finally withdrew from Afghanistan in August of 2021, Toby and David were watching, along with the rest of the world. One of the tragic ironies about Team Alpha's mission and the CIA mission after 9-11, I think, is that it was so successful so quickly. Despite the success, you could see the seeds of a number of things that would really bedevil the American effort for the next two decades. Difficulties of handling prisoners, difficulties of coordinating airstrikes and friendly fire instances, the sort of murkiness of Afghan tribal and ethnic politics, of unreliable allies, of deals that are not everything they seemed. I think it led to a sense of I don't know whether it's hubris or arrogance, but a sense of we, America, can can do anything. We topple the Taliban in, in a matter of a few weeks. So, you know, let's shoot for the moon here. Let's try to build a democracy, a functioning sort of nation state that will be our ally for decades to come. That was classic mission creep, really, but that sucked America into a much broader, a more ambitious project. Afghanistan, the U.S. learned all too late, is not a place that Americans could just drop into and easily understand, as much as their early successes might have made it seem that way. David, who understood the locals better than anyone else on his team, is still quick to credit America's allies and careful to point out the other ways they've been shortchanged. A lot of times, Americans and other people say, wow, that was that was great what you guys did. That was hard stuff. And that's all true. But you have to remember there were Afghans then and now who were fighting this sort of war against the bad guys, against Al-Qaeda and so forth, for years and decades. They did put up a fight, especially the men we were fighting with back in 2001, those who did survive continued to serve in the Afghan government in the sort of the military and intelligence structure and continued to fight the enemy until the end. This is something that has so many layers and so many different nuances that an American, a Westerner can't come to terms with all of this and work it out. But I think rather than listening to those voices uh, from the people who knew the most about Afghanistan in those early days and had experienced those first few weeks, which had ended in, in success, the policymakers in Washington decided that uh, a much bigger mission could be undertaken and uh, the rest of it uh, literally became history. 
I continue to stay in contact with some Afghans and it, it doesn't take a lot of work to understand that those Afghans who were on our side have been left and abandoned fully uh, and that there's no amnesty for these men and their families. Everything that was promised to them by our government has been, you know, sort of abandoned as the United States does from time to time. We, we forget we very quickly forget. You can learn more about Team Alpha in Toby Harden's new book, First Casualty, the untold story of the CIA mission to avenge 9-11. Available in print and as an e-book now. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Join us next time for the start of a new three-part anthology, The Special Relationship. Or... If you're a subscriber to Spyscape Plus on Apple Podcasts, there's no need to wait. You can listen to it right now. <laughs>